Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Give me just a second to set up the, my presentation. We can proceed. All right, almost there. Can you see the presentation? Francesca, can you see the presentation? Yes, I can. Okay, for some reason, it's not appearing on my side. Okay. Um, good morning and welcome uh, to our webinar on certifications and certificates. Uh, we hope that the information we provide here will benefit you in understanding the value, the importance, and the differences uh, between these two important credentials. I am uh, Dr. Lee. I'm the Global Vice President for the Institute for Diversity Certification. All right, I'm sorry about that. Um, as I was saying, uh, we are here to uh, talk about the, the certificates and certifications and then to talk about the differences between the two. The main purpose being to understand how to advantage whichever one you choose to select. But the, the rest of the background on me, I've been with the Institute for Diversity Certification for 11 years and certified as a diversity executive for about the same amount of time. I've been involved in education training uh, for over 25 years, where I have uh, provided training in higher education, businesses, industries, and the military as well. Um, I hold multiple certifications and in various fields from uh, technology, education, uh, construction, as well as the military. And I see certification as fundamental to supporting good and trusted education and training, and as proof of a person's skills and abilities and their proficiency in their, in their selected fields to provide this training. I'm hosting this webinar with a friend and colleague, Francesca. Francesca, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Francesca Zinkovich and I am the Certification Program Manager for IDC. I have 18 years of experience in the certification and testing industry and I'm excited to be here to share my certification knowledge with you guys. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, on the agenda, we're gonna talk about the importance of credentialing, specifically certifications and certificates what a certification is, what a certificate is, why there is confusion between the two and the advantages of each of them. Now, the, the question really becomes, why is credentialing important in the first place? I mean, we have countless people and, and I, it's a concern for us because we have countless people <clears throat> who come to us after completing a certificate awarding program and I say certificate, I'm going to try to speak clearly and slowly because it is necessary. Um, only to realize that they didn't get what they expected, hoped, or paid for. Many times the training that is discovered after they pay for this certificate awarding program will end up costing more than the certification that could have been um, acquired if the person, if the business, if the industry understood what they were signing up for in the first place. And the, the mistake is honest because many think uh, they're both about the same, right? And the answer is absolutely not. And we're here to shine a little light on the matter so that you can be better informed, either for yourself and or to advise your leadership. The reason being, we're living in a time where getting reliable information is instrumental to success in business, safe operations in the workplace, and ultimately the thing that undergirds, undergirds most success, and that is trust in your leadership and or the people who are providing the training. Fundamental to that information, especially where the information results in training of any serious nature, is ensuring that the information is coming from a reliable an informed, credible source. In the realm of diversity, equity, and inclusion, there are many people who got into the game early and not metaphorically, but in fact, um, 
I, I'm trying to find a nice word. They made a whole lot of money, millions of dollars. And again, these are very in, entities who are now realizing that they didn't get what they paid for. There are many who were misled. I mean, people who were just getting uh, business started to businesses that was well, that were well established. And the reason being is they were mistaken a person with a certificate as having expert knowledge for providing them with the very training that they need to be successful in the entity without realizing that the people who are providing that training had no foundation, had no background, and were unable to provide them with what they needed to actually appreciate the value that, that diversity, equity, and inclusion could afford that entity. Again, <clears throat> it's not that people never find out. Our concern is that they find out too late because it, uh, it costs them money. It makes um, what we provide as a profession look less than worthy, unappreciated. And for businesses that are now considering DEI, or I should say reconsidering DEI or DEIA or any of the other uh, acronyms you may see attached to it, that's not worth the money spent. But here's the deal. The strategic imperative and the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion is clear. The question now becomes, how do we maintain this advantage and still use DEI? And you see that through, through the manipulation of the letters. Anything other than DEI, you may see IDA and any number of other things. But here's the thing. All of this comes behind not getting the information, not getting the professional training that they asked for in the first place. As a result of not being able to distinguish between certification and certificate owners, owners and people responsible for businesses, industries, and institutions didn't get the valuable training that they wanted. And because of that, they cannot see the reason for continuing in DEI, specifically the certification that says you are, you're receiving the training that you need in DEI. The confusion and assumptions about certification specifically as it relates to distinguishing certificates from certification is a problem. And think about this. In extreme cases, and wrongfully so, people use the two interchangeably. What I tend to do before I present any webinar or, or, or present a course or even have conversation with people a lot of the times, is I look on the internet and I use chat GPT and any other resource I have to look at what's out there and what people are seeing and what they're reading that informs their choices. And unfortunately, if you look up certification, you will hear them mentioned in the same voice and sometimes even see certificates. It is through informed people that can help your leaders, business owners, industry leaders, understand the value of certifications. As much as both credentials are valuable, they are not the same. Therefore, clearly understanding the difference between the two is imperative. That way, we can appreciate the purpose for which each of them was designed, and they both have advantages. The idea is to understand which is which and how to, how to advantage ourselves by selecting the one that we choose. Frank, Jess. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So the importance of certification, these are some of the topics that we're gonna go through. Um, so I'm gonna explain the certification process a little in depth, the governing bodies, why certification is important and the certification and professional development. We can move on to the next slide, Dr. Lee. Okay, thank you. So the certification process can vary depending on the specific certification that you're pursuing but there are some general steps that are pretty common. So I'm gonna go over those um, individually. So I'd like to start with eligibility. So you first would have to check the eligibility requirements for the certification that you're interested in. And these can include education, experience, or training. Some certifications also require you to be a member. For IDC certification, um, we have different eligibility requirements for the Certified Diversity Professional and the Certified Diversity Executive. 
So for the CDP, you have to have two years of experience. We do have more details um, about that on the website and in our candidate handbook, but um, that is for CDP. For CDE, you have to have five years of experience and a leadership role. So those are gonna vary depending on your certification, but um, before you would even sign up to take a test, you wanna make sure that you meet those prerequisites because um, a certification will either ask you to um, prove those through um, employer verification or attest to them. Also for certification eligibility at IDC, we also will require you to have a passing score on your knowledge exam and a passing score on your candidate project. And we'll go into that a little bit more. But aside from that, we also ask all candidates who are applying for certification to attest to complying with our code of ethics, our standard of practice, and our candidate handbook. So it's really important that um, our candidates read the website and the handbook because it has a lot of information about these requirements. Um, those are all publicly available on our website. Okay, please go on to, oh, nope, sorry. That's me, go back. Number two is the application. So once you are sure that you meet the eligibility requirements, you can apply for the certification. You will pay a fee, and as I mentioned, right where you um, would apply and pay for that exam or program, you are gonna attest to meeting our eligibility requirements. The next step would be preparation. So once your application is approved, you'll need to start preparing for the exam. And this could include a preparatory course, studying from a textbook, online resources, or practicing with sample questions. I'd like to make note that the preparatory course um, for IDC, you do not have to take our particular preparatory course to be eligible for certification. So you can take your course somewhere else and you can come take exam only with us. Okay, number four is the exam. So an exam is usually a multiple choice test that covers the material of the certification program following an exam's content outline and blueprint. You can find our content outline and blueprint on the website at any time. So you can do that before you even apply um, and that'll show you um, what to follow, what to learn for the exam and what we'll, we will be testing you on. So the format of the exam can depend on the certification, but it's typically now computer-based and administered at a testing center. There are still some organizations that use paper pencil testing, but those are being phased out, but you still could um, come into contact with those. So IDC's exams are done on the computer, either at one of our testing sites or at your own home using a personal computer. And that program that we use, it's called RP Now, but the process is called a record and review. So you will use your laptop to record the room to make sure that nobody else is in there. You'll show your ID, um, you'll take a photo, and um, you will be recorded to make sure you're not, you're not breaking any rules, you don't have any uh, materials in front of you and staff would review that um, after the fact. So both the CDP and CDE are 100 uh, question multiple choice exams. They're each worth one point and you must achieve a 73 on the CDP or a 74 on the CDE to pass and you'll receive your results immediately after taking the test. Okay, moving on to number five. So performance-based assessment. So in the certification world, we will commonly also call this a practice test or exam. So not every certification will have a performance-based assessment. A practical exam or performance-based assessment is 
an assessment where a candidate demonstrates their ability to perform a task to do a job. And then an examiner or a grader would observe the candidate and then give them a grade based on their performance. As um, I mentioned before, before our prerequisites, you must complete a candidate project. So a candidate project is a professional work that's going to demonstrate your experience in the field of DE&I. Then an examiner will review your project with a rubric and they will provide you with a score. Okay, moving on to certification. So now you have all this great work done. You'll be notified in writing once you successfully pass the knowledge exam and the candidate project. And you'll be able to use your certification immediately. You'll be able to use those credentials on LinkedIn, on your resume. And we do have credential and trademark guidelines for certificates at the end of our candidate handbook. So that's a great place to, to go for that. Okay. And then moving on to the last piece, which is recertification or maintaining your certification. So some certifications are gonna require you to maintain your certification by completing continuing education courses or retaking exam and exam every few years. So currently at IDC, this can only be done by paying um, your recertification fee, which is $50 every three years and accruing continuing education credits. So for both um, CDP and CDE certificates, you must accrue 60 continuing education credits. So that's only 20 CEUs per year. And IDC has information on how to document these credits and what is acceptable on our website and also in the candidate handbook. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, now to talk about the governing bodies that are important to IDC and a lot of certifications in general. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the Institute for Credentialing Excellence or um, also most of the time just called ICE for short. So um, ICE is a professional membership asso association that provides education and resources for credentialing the credentialing industry. And it's the leading developer of standards for certification and certificate programs. And I think Dr. Lee had some notes that they are responsible for 695 different credentialing agencies. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me throw something in there for you, piggyback on what Francesca was saying. The, the reason for the emphasis on the governing body behind these credentials is we also want you to be armed with questions to ask people who may be providing you training as, as consultants, that there should be something to support what they're giving you and substantiate their, their credibility through evidence. Institutes, in, in this case, Francesca talking about the ICE, provides that evidence to rigorous standards that must be met for, you to, for them to be uh, accepting of your credentialing program as reputable. Thank you. And so ICE um, offers accreditation to professional certification programs um, through the National Commission of Certifying Agencies, so the second one there on the slide, or NCCA for short. That is who IDC is seeking their accreditation through. So there are 24 standards that we must adhere to. And um, they were developed to help ensure the health, welfare, and safety of the public. So um, also, Doc, you had that NCCA is responsible for 135 independent agencies. Right. So this is called public information. If you go to their website, you can see anybody that holds this accreditation. So um, accreditation it's like a mini certification, but for a program or an organization. So as Doc had mentioned, um, they are evaluated against defined standards and awarded recognition if they're in compliance with these standards. I also wanted to mention why um, you know, accreditation is important. So you know that a you know that a particular organization or program that is accredited is following certification and accreditation's best 
practice. They've gone through a rigorous process using certification professionals and statistics to prove that the exams are valid and reliable. This is the same thought or idea that you would have about a college that you would choose to, to go to and invest your time and money. You wanna make sure that that college is accredited and following certain standards. Okay. Absolutely. What one piggyback a little? I, I do this. Uh, one more thing I, I want to mention, just to basically, I'm I'm into the, the iterative process, understanding the value and what Francesca just presented. And through these agencies, um, you know, the certification holders are verifying are verifying that they can demonstrate the skills, the knowledge, the ability, and the trust necessary for you to have the confidence in what you're going to be provided with after they leave, such that you can represent something that's gonna be beneficial to your business, your industry, or your institution. Thank you, Doc. Mm -hmm. Okay, why is certification important? So Dr. Lee just mentioned it. Certifications can differentiate you from other professionals in your field, showing that you have demonstrated commitment to understanding and excelling in your profession. And on a personal level, it increases your earning potential, your credibility. It gives you a competitive advantage and career advancement. And it also increases your confidence and boosts your productivity. So it kind of just puts you a step above the rest. Okay, next slide. Certification in your professional development. Um, what you heard Francesca mention was a little bit of uh, some of the advantages of, of having a certification or a certificate. Your professional development is what you're going to continue developing as you, I'm going to say, become more experienced in the field of your endeavor. If you're already working at a place, the idea is to find a way to make yourself more valuable to that place. And the best way to do that is to keep yourself informed with the most current information uh, or um, skills that are available in your industry. Sometimes these are referred to as best practices. In the case of certifications and uh, certificates, they can be used as part of that uh, of your professional development. Some examples of certifications uh, that have been used as a part of professional development might be uh, your professional management, I don't know, project management professional called PMP. Um, Six Sigma, uh, uh, the, the, the profession of human resources, might be SPHR, PHR, uh, CPAs, your certified public accountants, uh, a certified cybersecurity uh, uh, profession, leadership development certified profession. Each one of these things that I mentioned, and there are more in for every field that you might see where a safety concern is, is, is a question or um, uh, high performing industries, advancements in technologies, you're gonna find a certification requirement that says that the people who are working for you can in fact do what they say that they're going to do. And that what that which they're providing is gonna be a benefit in the long run, as you say, in immediately and in the long run. As far as certificates, now we're gonna talk about certification because we believe wholeheartedly in them. Through our perspective, we understand that you get more knowledge. You get a, a wider depth and breadth of knowledge through a certification process. But certificates do have value and they do have a place. So this is not to bash certificates and say that they're not worth your time because they do have a value. As far as certificates, they can be proven to be very advantageous because of their specificity. And that's what you have to think about when you look at a certificate with an understanding that it has a limited utility. In other words, if you get a certificate, it says you can do a thing that you may be familiar with a thing well to some degree, depending upon the certificate. Inside businesses, where you see certificates being used more, and it's not new, but you see them being used in like Microsoft, you get Microsoft certificates, you get Google certificates, G uh, General Electric has their own certificate. Every major industry, IBM, have their own certificate. But where they're looking for expertise, those very same ones also have certifications. Again, both are beneficial. What's important is that you understand how each one is used and how each one will advantage you. 
Um, Coursera is another one, uh, sometimes referred to as MOOCs, open, massive open online courses. These show business and industry that you are involved in continuous learning, which as we all know, we're living longer, we're contributing better and longer in businesses and industry. And because of that, you have to accept the concept, and I'm switching the words deliberately, of long life learning. You know, lifelong learning rolls off too easy and the brain doesn't process it. When you think of it in terms of as long as you're in a workplace, you can contribute to that workplace by staying informed, by looking for ways to continue your personal growth. And oh, by the way, these things we're talking about also count as continuing education for your certification. Again, there is an advantage. <clears throat> we offer certificates through the IDC by attending some of our webinars. These things count towards continuous, uh, continuing education. Again, the idea is to understand how each one of them works, not mistaking one for the other. That's when the problem starts. As I said, there are many certificate awarding institutions that will charge you more than you pay for certification. And the question will become, well, Dr. Lee, why would they pay more if, if the if certificate had limited um, utility? because they're typically attached to eminent institutions or businesses. And it's that institutions that's going before the credential and it kind of throws you off. So pay attention. Make sure you take the information that, that Francesca presented you. Understanding that there are agencies that support the body of knowledge that's gonna be behind certifications. And make sure that what you're asking for is in fact what you're getting. And don't be afraid to ask questions. If you're asking questions of, let's say, um, of a consultant, and he, she, or they have some reservation about answering your questions, that's your first sign that more investigation needs to be uh, considered. Remember, this is about your business succeeding and the people who you bring into your place providing you with the, with the skills that you need to operate safely, efficiently, and advantageously. You want to add anything, Francesca? Okay. Certification certificates, the same. Again, we hope we've given you information already to make you realize they're not the same. But if you research them on your own, you may find evidence to believe that they are. Only through understanding what you're reading can you really understand what they're saying. I can tell people who are readers, whenever a book is written, whenever an article is designed, there are two things you have to make yourself aware of. And that's biases of the writer and the agenda of the persons who are, pre who are presenting it. Through those two lenses, you can begin to approach what you're really trying to get. Um, let's see here. As you have been hearing Francesca and myself speak, we're thinking, we are talking about certification through the lens of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and all the, the extensions that fall under the ubiquitous umbrella of DEI. You're going to hear uh, DEIA, DEIJ, DEIB. There are many other things. Uh, one thing we want you to realize is these things can be costly. As I mentioned earlier, there have been millions of dollars spent already in, in, in investments on this training. And basically, many have been, prom uh, been provided less than they've been promised. Now, I've mentioned some of the things about uh, people not being informed, confusing the certificates uh, and, and certification. But there are other things that have to be attributed to the results of the training and the reason for the selection of the training. And I mention these because I want you as a person who is informed to understand what may be going on in the minds of the people who are making these, what appears to be informed choices. Some of them is a, um, an attempt to save money. Thinking, I have a general idea that certif certifications take longer, so they may require more time. Some do. But as I said before, some certificates can cost more than certifications. Um, other problems is accepting, we'll just use consultants, as providing information that you needed without the requisite information that's required to support the credential. Another one is believing without questions because of the confusion that a person with a certificate has expert knowledge in a broad range 
of, of in this case, DEI, but in any area. And it just isn't true. My understanding that a person with a certificate has a limited amount of knowledge, but just by virtue of the design of the credential, that's what they know about. The halo effect tends to jump in here at this point where you hear them speak well and thoroughly and deeply about one piece of it, and you automatically assume the rest of what you needed is a part of what their knowledge base is. Ask the questions. Okay. Thank you, Doc. So I wanted to actually put the two definitions up on the screen to talk about the differences between them. So I did wanna read through. So a certificate is a non-degree granting program that provides instruction and training to aid participants in acquiring specific knowledge, skills, and or competencies associated with intended outcomes. So a training program you take, whether it's online or in-person, you might be in a classroom for a week learning, you may take some quizzes, but at the end you will receive a certificate. And as Doc mentioned, um, we are not saying certificates are not important. They are very important. In fact, I have a, um, one of the first things I did when I started my certification journey was I got a certification specialist um, certificate and it's on my resume. In fact, I think it helped me get this job. So they are important. We just want to make sure that we all know the difference between them. So a certification is a voluntary non-governmental process by which an individual is determined by a certification body to have successfully completed the requirements of a certification program and may be identified to the public and other stakeholders as a certificate. So we went through the certification process earlier during this webinar, and that was for a reason. You guys know the process now if you're looking to seek certification for yourself, but you also know the steps that make a certification a certification and not a certificate. So you know that a certification has prerequisites. So you must either attest or prove that you have this experience or a job role, as we mentioned earlier. There's a knowledge exam that you must pass and it may or may not have a practical component to it. If it does, you have to pass both of those to become certified. So in short, a certificate shows that you took a course and you have learned some knowledge about a skill or a job. And a certification shows that you took a course and you have retained that knowledge and you can apply it to your job or a role. And um, as we mentioned earlier, it's important to know the difference. So when you're out here, we talked about how expensive training is, certificates and certifications are, and we just wanna make sure that everybody knows what they are getting, um, whether that is diversity or PMP or an IT certification. So what else? What else needs to be considered as we talk about the certification processes, credentialing and all of that? Uh, Francesca mentioned the requirements of certification. That was our certification. Now, and as she mentioned also, and I mentioned also, there are other certifications. And many of them, as, as Francesca said, requires a certain level of education, a certain uh, proof of experience in the field. Um, these are things that are introduced not randomly or to disadvantage or um, eliminate some people from getting the, uh, the certification, but they're, they're designed to ensure that we, as a minimum, meet the industry standards for providing whatever training that we have. What we tend to do is meet and exceed industry standards. When you think about people who have been historically marginalized and otherwise qualified for positions, when you're able to put a credential on your resume, as Francesca mentioned, it goes before you as proof of your ability to perform. And that, that is one aspect that you get from certification that you won't get from most certificates because a part of a certification process typically requires you to do some type of performance. And the IDC as a part of our certification, we have a standardized test and we have a project which allows you to use practical application 
in the performance of the theory that you receive from the curriculum. Again, all of this provides you with advantages, a foundation of knowledge, a confidence in what you're learning, the ability to carry the language in a conversation uh, if it's DEI, not only DEI, but if it's HR or if it's PMP. This says that you are ready to perform in that industry to the success and advantage of that business. Um, Francesca mentioned, oh, sorry about that. Francesca mentioned that there may be a, a change. Oh yeah, that there may be a, um, a minimum work requirement. The reason for that is there is peculiar language that goes with expertise, which comes over time. That's necessary for you to understand how to apply this information. If you don't have that knowledge, you can't carry the conversation, which means you can't benefit that industry to the degree that they need to. The examinations are standardized. And the other part that we haven't mentioned that need, uh, I want to go without being said, is this is third party certification. So it's not something that you're doing inside your own business and say, yes, we can. We are all that we said we can be. This is a neutral body with established standards that will not be lowered to ensure that when you are awarded those things, you can produce what you say that you can produce. The code of ethics. When she mentioned that, I want you all to realize those same code of ethics that require you to operate a certain way ethically can also be the same codes that remove your credentialing if you violate those ethics. So once you get them, they're not yours to hold forever and do whatever you want. There's a requirement in the continuing education to maintain them. There's an expectation that you're going to perform uh, in, in that field professionally and represent the body that um, that governs that credential in a specific way. And if not, the repercussions is you won't have that certification. Um, she meant the, let's see, what else? What else I want to mention? Um, oh, I, I think she inferred this, and I'm going to say it specifically. Uh, there is a limitation on your on your uh, certifications. Uh, ours have three years. Within three years, you require, you require a certain amount of, uh, of continuing education credits and then a fee. Depending upon the field you go into, that time requirement may change. So it does require you to understand what it is that you have uh, earned, because it's not given to you, it's earned, and then what's required to maintain it. C certificates. We've been talking about uh, certification. What are the requirements to maintain your certificate? Most of the time it's one and done. Here's another thing that tends to discredit certificates. They can be given out in mass. In other words, you could be sitting in a class of 30 people, everybody complete whatever the training may be, whatever the situation test quiz, whatever it may be, and everybody's giving them out, 30, 40 of them at a time. Credentials, one at a time. It's yours to earn. As a matter of fact, as Francesca mentioned, and I'll, I'm going to go more specifically, uh, if there is a compromise as you are taking that final examination, you're done. And it could be to the tone of paying a, an additional testing fee. And Francesca, you can speak more smartly on that. I don't even know if that's how that works. When a, when a test compromise situation happens as far as certification, uh, we have a, 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 an additional fee, but how does the um, a governing body happen to test compromise? Are you talking about during the exam or? If, if a person is accused of test compromise, the, the, that part of the test is essentially dead in the water. Is it just a normal retest or is there other well, things? It, it's more of a longer process than that. So of course we would, there would be an investigation by staff and then we would take the matter to our discipline and appeals committee and they would decide um, what we would do going forward. Um, because if it's cheating involved, that's that's really bad. <laughs> yes. We and, and wouldn't that's just why. let you, we wouldn't just let you retest. I mean, there would be an investigation into it first. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, we do um, have a question. Can, can you read it or do you want me to read it? Yes, sure. When considering the certification process for the CDP exam preparation options, include either independent study, eight week prep course, or three day virtual academy through IDC, which of these options has provided the most exam success? Or 
are there any other preparation options that are not as costly? To confirm, there is an application for exam preparation and an application for certification. All right, Chess, you want to take the second part? I'll take the first part. Yeah, so it's just one application. So when you sign up, you would either sign up to do the course and the exam through us or just the exam. As far as the preparation piece, um, we leave that up to the individual to decide how he, she, or they can best prepare themselves for the examination. What we do at the IDC, usually through me, is if you are preparing for your examination and there are some questions that require clarification, then I set up a one-on-one -on -one to answer those questions. Uh, what we do through our, through our uh, preparation processes is we preach uh, that you take the test when you are comfortable and ready. If there's any reservation, we suggest you reach out to us. Let's talk about your reservations talk about some strategies that will help you prepare to be successful for the examination to set you up for success. A um, little bit about my background. I mentioned a little, just some of my credentials, but um, I have been educating and training business and industry. I say for 25, but it's been for more than that. Um, my expertise is in adult education. So I understand uh, the reticence. Some people have test anxiety. I have strategies to help you get through that. I have study strategies that I mentioned to every person if that you can add to your repertoire to prepare you for the test. And we have those which we have found to be more successful specifically for our standardized tests that position you for success. So as far as satisfying the curriculum piece, whether you take the eight week, the three day virtual, or you do the self-study, you still have access to the faculty and staff to ensure that any reservations or concerns you have about satisfying the requirements to pass the examination are met and that you're ready. So when most of the people go in there using our processes, they do well. Now, the conflict comes in many of our, our, our candidates, our professionals such as yourself. I say this is Dr. Rakim. Many of PhDs, attorneys, uh, CPAs, uh, all kind of doctors and they have processes that they have used before coming to us to, uh, as I like to say, reconcile our standardized test. And some fail, I'll be just put it quite bluntly, and I mean fail miserably. They think that maybe the, the test is like any other test that they've taken. But what I can assure you is that the test writing principles that we use through Ohio State University, test writing psychologists, and, and multiple subject matter experts, not just one or two, multiple, to, to ensure we have the perspectives that are relative to the material that we have produced. That sometimes it is only through discussing the processes with us can you satisfy what needs to happen to successfully um, pass our tests. So I know that was a kind of winded, but it seems like a simple question on the surface, but there's a lot to consider. Oh, well, thank you for the question. And if there's any other questions, by all means, post them in the chat. We welcome them. I should have said that in the beginning. I like questions more than I like to speak because I found that um, the questions that are on your mind is what really gives what we do as training uh, its its bite because you are able to apply what we're talking about in a, in, a, in a really meaningful way and benefit yourself from our certification processes. Okay, let's see. Uh, were there any more questions, Amber? Not at this time. Okay. The last thing I want to say that I was um, that I was talking about the certificates, and this is for you to consider. It's not to berate certificates, but here's the other thing. Anybody can issue a certificate. Literally, if I decided I was going to have a, a consultancy, and then as a part of completing the training that I provide you, award your certificate, it is a certificate a certificate of completion. The credibility behind what I provided you is another question altogether. Ah, uh, okay. I just saw a question, Amber. Okay. It says, "Do you use do you use pretests or practice tests 
as a part of the learning study process. You want me to repeat the question? No, I, I heard okay. you fine. Okay. Right. So you want that one or me? I, I would need to hear the question again. Sorry. Do you use pre-test or practice test as a part of the learning slash studying process? Yes, we have we have practice tests. Actually, Doug, I think that would have been better for you. <laughs> I didn't want to answer all of them. Absolutely. We do have pre-tests. As a matter of fact, as, as a part of the strategies that we would that we would discuss with you about how to successfully navigate the, the test, is there is a pre-test. Okay, let's back it up more. For our for our uh, certified diversity professional, there are 16 competencies. At the end of each competencies, there are pre-test questions, we call them study questions. Those questions are designed to familiarize you with the material that is in the competency. By becoming very familiar with the material that is in the competency through those questions, you are better positioned to handle the standardized test. Now, as I mentioned before, there are additional strategies that we would discuss with you one-on-one -on -one once you find out where your, you know, where your concerns or, or constraints may be. That combined with these with these study guide, guide questions at the end of each competency will prepare you for the standardized test. So absolutely. My thing, uh, I consider myself a, as an expert in the field of adult education, is I don't believe in surprises. I believe that when adults are told what the expectations are, given the tools to meet those expectations and the time to prepare, then you will be able to satisfy whatever the requirement may be. But if any of those are compromised, the probability of success you know, is decreased. So we try to cover all those eventualities. Okay, we have another question. What is the pass rate of the CDP exam? We have a few numbers in there, Francesca. I will look that up, but I will mention it at the end because I want to make sure I have the correct information to give. Okay. And, and while Francesca's researching that, what tends to happen for people who are considering our certification process is they look back at the history of the test that was given before the one that we recently designed. I, I would not suggest you use those numbers as indicative of the pass rate for the test we've currently written. Like I said, we had a different cadre of team, a different cadre of professionals. And because we have, uh, like I said, the, the Ohio State University as a part of our team in designing of that um, examination, the results are going to be different. Which you may also find if you found our old histories that had a cutoff score of 80. The cutoff score for our new tests for the um, CDP, was it 73, 74? But which one for 70? One was, one, one was 73 and one was 74. So the CDP is 74, the CDE is 73. Or okay. no, sorry, vice versa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did but, I did find that information though. So just to mention on our websites, um, a requirement of accreditation is that we have this information public. So you can actually go on there and see our 2023 annual statistics report. So I do have that information. So for the CDP exam, our pass rate was 74% and the CDE is 76%. I won't get into the details of psychometrics today, but that is a good pass rate. <laughs> that, and that, that is a good pass rate. And, and I will say this, I'm going to attribute those pass rates to people like you who actually call us, take advantage of the availability of our team to help you in the preparation process is such that you are comfortable going in, that your anxiety levels are lower, you're calmer and you're prepared. I believe if you look back in the history, I think this predated Francesca and myself, the numbers were significantly lower for the pass rates. But again, we tried to consider all of the um, barriers or constraints that might interfere with a person becoming certified because when you do, we not only want you to pass the test. As a matter of fact, if you in, if you sign up for our certification process, I de-emphasize the test specifically. And the reason being is through our conversational learning process, we prepare you with, with the practical application of the knowledge such that you know that by being able to use it in a real world context in your workplace, 
you are prepared to satisfy the standardized test through that application. So again, if you're considering it, I think it is an awesome program. And I think the, the training that you'll get with the combined with the conversations from a worldwide audience, literally, you will have um, a certification that is well worth your time and beneficial in whatever capacity you choose to use, it, whether it's in the workplace or as a consultant. And by the way, love the questions, keep them coming. I think that's all I want to say about that sort of certificate, I think. Uh, individual, mass. Okay, I can't think of anything else. Let's see. All right. While you read through this roster, because I I wouldn't torture you by reading through all of those, you can read through each of them. By, the means, by all means, if you have any questions, ask about any one of those as they're compared side by side. It is not an, an exhaustive list, but it is a good listing of the differences. Uh, and I like to say that and the advantages as well. Uh, Why you do that? I'll say this. Um, certifications not only protect the business from possible lawsuits, because there's always that. There's always a person ready to rush to the attorney and get something for nothing, as I say. It's also a process to ensure that the practitioners are qualified to do the job. Because let's be honest, there are very few businesses that are hiring people to retirement. Many times people work in an industry for five or 10 years and realize the money that they're making at that business or that industry could be dwarfed by becoming a, a consultant in the same field. There's nothing more appealing to a prospective uh, client than seeing years of experience coupled with a national certification. And that's what we offer, by the way, because it's proof that you can perform the job. It's also an indicator of your ability to get a job and keep a job. And this is what people are looking for. And top talent is the number one thing in 2024. Well, there's something else coming too, but that's a topic for another day called environmental social governance. Um, depending upon one's need, as, as we said before, each one of these things can be a viable choice. But it's important to know uh, what you're getting when you spend your money. I always come back to that because money seems to be at the forefront of people's mind. If you're an odd person like me, I'm driven by knowledge. And I'm always looking for good knowledge to add to my knowledge base because to me, it informs you on how to ask better questions. And through that process, you really get the benefit of the training. Um, Francesca mentioned, were you gonna say something, Francesca? When you're done. No, go ahead. I won't forget where I am. Um, I just wanted to mention you had on here that certifications are time limited, a good thing, and certificates may uh, never expire which mm -hmm. is a really good point, especially when you're thinking about an industry like DEI that is changing all the time and evolving. Um, one of the requirements of accreditation and just certifications best practice is that you revisit your program um, every few years. So depending on what it is you do, um, to create a program at the beginning, it's called a job task analysis. You basically go through the job skills and tasks um, that are required for your program. An industry like DEI, we would revisit that every two to three years. Some organizations only need to do it every five years, but an industry like ours, we always want to be looking at what has changed. So when you have certificates, um, they're always going to stay up to date. They need to read the new standards that are updated, new resources. A person with a certificate, they learned what they learned at that time, and then they just move on. So I just wanted to make that point because it's... No, that's that's a very good point. And I, I'm, my brain's kind of spinning because there's so many advantages. Uh, Looks like there's another question, uh, Autumn. Okay. Yes, it's a payment plan. I you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's payment pay in full or all are their payment plan options. Ooh. Now I will say, Francesca, I'm going to take this because here's here's my thing on that. That's a good question, and I deliberately not answer questions about financing the program because we have a person, our CFO, that will handle all those questions and tell you about the options that are available. 
So I would want to tell you something here that might not be consistent with what our CFO wants as a process. So call us and uh, like as Francesca said, there's a lot on the website itself. But if there's any ambiguity or any questions you may have about the pricing, speak to our CFO and she can answer any questions you want and ask is ask her just like you're asking me. And I want you to ask her as many questions as you can to make sure that you're getting what you paid for. We are no exception. I think you'd be satisfied with what you get. Another question, Amber? I got it right that time. Let me see. No, it's not a question. Oh, okay. My thing, little, little red flag pops down. Um, there was something else I wanted to pick back on that you said um, about being a good thing. Oh, 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 I know what it was. Um, Francesca mentioned that uh, the DEI is changing. <laughs> I, I would say almost daily. And I say that for this reason. We're learning more and more every day about who has been historically uh, marginalized. And with that, we're also finding out more and more each day how people who have been historically marginalized can be a business strategy for a gaining company. So through these processes, the only way you can remain current is by staying in the, in the, in the literature. We're looking right now, we're dealing with AI, chat GPT and all the manifestations and the variations of it. We talk about that. We have processes in place right now that's, that's designed for AI. We tell you how it works. And I'll just speak very, 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 very quickly. But until AI approaches general intelligence, um, it's not a threat to people who know how to use it as a tool, as a pen or a pencil or a book or anything else is used. What's also important to acknowledge right now, if you haven't considered it going forward, is that if you are in a what I call a people endeavor, if what you're doing concerns interacting with people and helping people succeed in whatever fashion, you will have a job even in the proliferation of AI, because the nuances that this thing does cannot be duplicated in AI. But anything else that can be reduced to a repetitive, or reduced to a repetitive action is subject to be replaced by a tool in artificial intelligence. But here again, one of the things we talk about in our in our dialogue in our conversation is thinking well. We we operate in a very emotional space. Pragmatism and how to navigate this space is critical. These are things that we cover. Uh, let's see. Demonstrates a mastering. Um, one of the things uh, I like to point out also, in, in on the on the certificate time, uh, certificate side, that fourth bullet where it talks about typically, uh, a certificate is open to anyone regardless of their work experience. A I like to say a critical part of being a, um, successful as far as a consultant is having a lived and working experience in the field where you are deeming yourself an expert. Because you and I and anyone who is uh, trained at high, in higher levels know a certification does not make you an expert. I'm sorry, I wish we could do that. Only time in the field with a body of knowledge to support your efforts do you become an expert. So we provide that foundation. We like to say we provide you with the language to articulate the value proposition that is what we do. Let's see. Ah. We both can jump on this one. Why it matters. A lot of these, it's, it's starting to be iterative, but it's by design. I believe in education, the more you hear a thing, the greater the probability of you being able to recall it. And the function of the brain is called myelination, right? So all we're doing is reiterating points because it's necessary. Why certification matters? It's a proof of your competence. Francesca mentioned that. There's a certain amount of trust, and trust is huge, by the way. Um, also, in the course, you also get bombarded with me recommending books because there's a lot to know. But trust, credibility, and respect that comes from competence. That trust I mentioned first because without it, everything else that you might consider, I'm gonna say being nice has a low probability of being accepted and your position being considered. 
because you can have the best information in the world, but if there's low trust, and there's a trust equation by a guy named uh, McBain. No, no, no. Slips of mind. But where, where the trust is low, regardless of what you know, it may be slow in being accepted, which discredit, which say takes away from you who taking the time to earn the information that you need to be considered. Building that trust and having knowledge and being able, being able to share that knowledge has everything to do with you getting the opportunity that you might otherwise be entitled to. Um, let's see. Continuous learning. We touched that already. Be Were you going to say something, uh, Francesca? Okay. Uh, continuous learning. The reason being is what we do is very organic. We're dealing with one of the most, com one of the most complex things on the planet. And that's the human personality. Who you meet on Wednesday might not even be the same person you talk to on Thursday. And all that goes with him, her, or them as they come into the workplace is what's required of us to meet them where they are and allow them to work in a high-performing, safe environment. We talk about psychological safety. I mean, what that really is. It's thrown around too willy-nilly right now. I'll throw this out there because I'd be remiss in my existence if I didn't mention at least one book. But this one has, because we're talking about psychological safety, check out Amy Edmondson and Timothy Clark. The reason is, this is a part of what's required for us to do what we do well. Safety, quality assurance. Certification provides you with industry standards and the knowledge to ensure that we not only meet it, we exceed those industry standards. Rightly or wrongly, people who have been historically marginalized are perceived through a lens of incompetence first. By being able to articulate why you should be there and let them see the strategic imperative that comes with you being in that place increases the probability of them wanting you to be around. And that's all we're trying to do. Maintaining standards, certification provides that opportunity. We like to exceed those standards. We speak through, um, I like to say a lens, not to overuse the word, um, of, a, of an uncompromising dedication to ensure that the standards that are never lowered. As a matter of fact, the rigor built into the certification process ensures that those who get the certification can meet the standards easily. Your continued work allows you to exceed those standards as a normal part of your functioning. Again, it's important to know uh, what a certification is and what a certificate is. And the differences to ensure that you get what you're paying for and, and the advantage of both. As Francesca and I have said, it's not that either one is bad, it's both have good qualities. The thing is for you as a person who's considering either one of them know exactly what it is you're getting and then being able to use your advantage once it's acquired. All right, questions, comments, takeaways. Anything you want to ask us as parting words, parting questions?